What makes a qubit especially exotic is the complex amplitudes in the formula describing its state. Intuitively, we cannot relate such a construct to anything from our everyday experience. The purpose of this appendix is to demonstrate via a concrete example how those complex amplitudes arise. The example I will use here is photon polarization in monochromatic light. However, I would also like to make it clear that the aim here is not to explain the physics of polarization, but only to show how complex numbers get into the picture. So don't worry if you don't know what monochromatic light is, or if some of the formulas are not 100% clear along the way, because such details are not part of the key takeaways to remember. Ok, so let's start. As you must have all learned in high school, light is a stream of tiny particles called photons. Photons behave according to the strange rules of quantum mechanics, and they were discovered only at the beginning of the 20th century. Before that, light was believed to be continuous. In the following, we will focus on the important physical property of photons called polarization. But before we do that, I'd like to quickly take a step back. So generally speaking, there are two sides, the physical properties and their mathematical representations. For example, the off state of a light bulb may be represented by zero, while the on state by one. What I want you to see here is that the mathematical representation is just a labeling and we are free to change it as we wish, as long as we find the new labels useful. Ok, now we are ready to get back to photon polarization. Our goal is only to find the most suitable mathematical representation. The first representation I show you is geometrical. It's a directed ellipse with a normalization constraint on its size. It looks a bit more complicated than just 0 and 1, but the situation is essentially the same as before. Just as 0 and 1 represented different states of the light bulb, different directed ellipses represent different polarization states of the photon. I won't tell you more details about the ellipse here, it's not needed for this appendix. But if you want to find out more about this representation, check out the Appendix B video. What's important here is to realize that a geometrical figure can be quite cumbersome to deal with in calculations. That's why we consider a second representation, which is the parametric equation of the directed ellipse. T is the only variable here, while A, B, alpha and beta are constants. H and V denote the horizontal and vertical unit vectors, respectively. As the formula is fully symbolic, it looks easier to manipulate in calculations. It's important to note here that the relationship between directed ellipses and parametric equations is one to many, because if we shift both angles alpha and beta by the same amount, the resulting parametric equation will represent the same directed ellipse as before. Other than that, the geometric and the parametric equation representations are equivalent. If we know one of them, we can figure out the other and vice versa. But still, there is a problem with this formula too. The cosines are also very cumbersome to deal with in calculations. And this is the point where complex numbers come into the picture, because introducing them will make our life much easier, leading to both technical and theoretical advantages over the naive parametric equation. So here is the third representation, the so-called Jones vector, which has only two components, two complex numbers in exponential form. It contains the same four constants as the previous formula, just differently packaged. Basically, the cosines have been replaced by complex numbers, which are technically easier to manipulate using intuitive algebraic rules. The Jones vector is also appealing theoretically, because it's amenable to linear algebra treatment. And again, the three representations are equivalent. If we know one of them, we can figure out the others. Now, as I said before, what we have in the Jones vector is just two complex numbers, so we can write them simply as a and b. Then, by using vector algebra, we can also write the Jones vector this way. And from this, we can see that the Jones vector is formally like a qubit. It's really just a matter of notation. Let's replace the 1, 0 vector by the 0 cat and the 0, 1 vector by the 1 cat. And we are done. Here is the qubit with complex amplitudes. Remember, this is still the very same Jones vector as before, only the notation has changed to 
qubit style. So the polarization state of a single photon can be described mathematically as a qubit. And this isn't just a symbolic coincidence, because physically, photons do behave like qubits, that is, according to the strange rules of quantum mechanics. So here is what you should remember. First of all, using complex numbers is just a mathematical convenience. Second, the polarization state of the single photon can be used as a qubit. And as a bonus exercise, you can try to verify that multiplying A and B by the same so-called global phase, e to the i times theta, does not change the corresponding underlying directed ellipse. That is, multiplying the qubit by a global phase does not matter because it will represent the same polarization state of the photon.